over the past Sundays, our leaders have been directing our focus to the subject of surrender. And by now, I think you would have drawn the conclusion that they are taking us to examine more deeply and more specifically our spiritual growth, development, our spiritual maturity. So for all the discussions we have had so far, you would have noticed that there's a thin thread that ties them all together. That they all are foc focusing our attention, our energies, on the whole matter of becoming more of the person God wants us to be in Christ Jesus. The topic that has been assigned for today is prayer and the word in a surrendered life. Prayer and the word in a surrendered life. And that is going to be the focus of our attention this morning. And we are going to be drawing on some of the things that we have been discussing since we began this theme. We want to tie some ends together and we are going to even go back to reflect a bit on some of what we have been learning over the past year. Because I'm sure by now you would have noticed that any discussion, any focus on the subject of surrender is at the heart of who God wants us to be. That the whole idea of surrender speaks to the issue of discipleship. It speaks to the issue of faith walk. It speaks to the issue of becoming more like Christ. In other words, it is all tied up into all the virtues of who a good Christian should be. They are all tied up in the whole principles and practices of the maturing Christian. So I want to start today by just reflecting, refreshing, just so that we are on the same page. What is it that we are looking for in this whole issue of surrender, in this whole matter of maturing, in this whole drive of becoming more and more like Christ? What is it we want to look like as we move in this direction? I would like to borrow on a term that we introduced when we met the last time, and I got the nod from our leadership. We added to the description of the topics a surrendering life. You may recall we had clarified what we meant, and we are saying that a surrendered life is not just an act that took place and is done with. We are surrendering the whole matter of surrender is something we do continuously. We get up each day and we choose again to surrender. We don't surrender only when we gave our hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus. We surrender each day as we choose to walk in obedience to his word. So we want to use that term in our discussion today. And I want for those who probably did not meet with us the last time to understand the background against which we have come up with that coinage. So when we talk about a surrendering life, when we talk about a maturing person, who are we looking for? What does that look like? Loving Heavenly Father, we pause once again to examine your word. We are mindful that we know so very little. But we want to express to you our heart's desire that we are willing to learn. Lord, we confess that we have not always practiced the things you have taught us and we have always been coming up short. But we are learning to surrender. And in surrendering, we are trusting you in your continued patience, 
loving kindness and tender mercies toward us to help us a little bit more. This morning, we want to consider the whole importance of prayer and the word as we seek to be more surrendered. We look to you today because we know we can't do it without you. And for every heart that is now bowed in your presence, I pray, O oh precious Holy Spirit, that you may meet with us and teach us as only you can. Hear us, we pray, because we ask these mercies from hearts that truly love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So the maturing Christian is not a perfect person. I know there are times when the world will look on us when they find out that we are Christians and they are expecting that as Christians you don't make mistakes. You don't do anything wrong. And the moment you do something that in their view is not Christ-like or Christian-like, they are ready to chastise you. And who is usually more ready to chastise than the unsaved? Or you say you are Christian. And maybe they don't do it to you because you don't make as many mistakes as I do. So when we talk about a maturing Christian, we are not talking about a perfect person. This is a Christian whose all-consuming desire is to live a life that is pleasing to God. I want you to notice the emphasis in this definition. It is not on perfection or sinless perfection. It is on a desire that is all-consuming and pointing in one direction to honor and please the Lord. So for those of the Bible scholars who are among us today, whether virtually or otherwise, who would have examined the life of David, for example, would have also noticed that the Lord gave him a commendation that we have never seen anywhere else in the word. That David, the same David, not this one, who not only plotted, but schemed in such a way to make sure that his sins were covered. The same David who God said you are disqualified from constructing my temple because your hands are filled with blood. This same David, God Almighty said, was a man after his own heart. <laughs> and I know those who like to judge the Christian would have written off David long time. <laughs> Because David is not the kind of Christian that we have at Bethany. But here the commendation, and here it is coming from. Have you ever stopped to wonder why? Well, here is the secret. God is interested in the heart. God has found in David... A man whose true desire is to honor him. Oh yes, he blundered. Maybe that is not in the right word. <laughs> but he got a commendation from the Lord that I would love to hear one day. So this person that we are talking about is someone who is growing and is somewhere on the rung of the spiritual ladder. Maybe they are behind you, maybe they are above you, but they are working their way up the spiritual ladder. And it is obvious because in their speech, in their actions, how they conduct business, it is obvious that the Lord is with them. This person is a healthy, maturing, 
surrendering Christian. So when we talk about someone who is surrendered, or someone who is surrendering, this is the person we are expecting to see. So there might be a few persons that you might want to put back on your list who you had written off. You might want to put them back because you notice that they are somewhere on the wrong of the spiritual ladder. They may not be as far up as you. Maybe they come up and go back down and come up and go back down, but they determine that they're going up. But they are somewhere there. Without a doubt, brothers and sisters, friends, the biggest problem that we have in the church today is that of spiritual immaturity. Yes, we have a lot of other problems. We don't have enough funds to do some of the projects we need to do. We have in a hard time to get persons to make themselves available for the areas of ministry that we seek to execute. And although there are genuine and difficult problems with which we must grapple, that's not the biggest problem we have. Our biggest problem is our immaturity. We get ourselves into all kinds of problems by saying immature things, by making immature decisions, by acting in immature ways. We do so by doing things at the wrong time, with the wrong person, in the wrong place, using the wrong words. In other words, we lack wisdom because we are not maturing. We need to become spiritually mature. And we get to become spiritually mature by making ourselves at the place where we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. We need to grow up. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 tells us to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Remember what we said last time when we met. In God's kingdom, the way up is down. The way down is to surrender. And to surrender is to become more mature. I don't know if you are seeing the link I'm trying to make. But I want for us to appreciate the, draw, the, the vast difference between how the world looks at progress as against how God describes progress for us as his followers. Did you know that it is God's will that every single Christian becomes spiritually mature? I know we make a lot of excuses about where we are spiritually. Sometimes we make comments like, that's a mistake. <laughs> At the sign when we born under. At the month when we born, so we can't help it. Brothers and sisters, that's not, true. that's not true for the child of God. When we become born again, even if that is so in other places where your sign rule your behavior, there is a different ruling that takes place. Because the Bible tells us that he who is in Christ is a new creature. You are born again. And you have been re-engineered with new influences that will dictate how we live and how we have our being. So we don't call Christian lucky. <laughs> there is no such thing for the child of God about lucky. Lucky is for the person who is waiting on Lato. <laughs> well, assuming that the Christian is not doing it. <laughs> but the whole idea behind who we are rests in our willingness to become who God wants me to be. And that's why Paul was able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So brothers and sisters, maturing is not an option because becoming mature is an expectation of God. And what God is expecting 
is not a, as Brother Teddy would say, is not a multiple choice. Paul, in fact, scolds the Christian in Corinth for her lack of maturity. In referring to the church, he treats her members as if they are babies in Christ. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you are not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able, for you are still carnal. That's not a word I really want for anyone to justifiably call me. I am working hard to get away from that kind of a Christian that Paul is talking about. Because that kind of Christian is the Christian who is not maturing, that is not surrendering, and therefore is not growing. For where there are envy, Paul continued to say, strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So let me make the connection here. You see when somebody is surrendering and you insult them, you get a different response from the Christian who is not surrendering. You see the Christian who is not surrendering? When they respond, you will never ever do it again. <laughs> I, I, I was not going to say, you know, how I think some people would respond. But let me just say, just so that I don't get thrown off the platform. They'll fix your business. <laughs> yeah, some of us know used to be the tongue, you know. <laughs> you know, they used to say that sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not true. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Words break more than bones. <laughs> we are now learning from this, the specialists that words from significant others in our lives can permanently paralyze us. And you never reach your objectives in life because when those words are finished with you, you feel like nothing. And that is why I am really grateful for the love of God. Because had it not been for the love of God, some of us, <laughs> I don't know where we would end up. But in his mercy, in his grace, he sought us who are nothing. <laughs> and he makes us into something. That's why some of us are able to have some kind of sense of worth. You hear psychologists working with people, trying to help them to find back their, their sense of belonging, their sense of focus, sense of direction. And they will do all kinds of interventions like psychoanalysis in order to determine where the breakdown began, how it has been sustained, and how to break it. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When we surrender to the Lord Jesus, all of that rally house mash up. He takes care of all the details. And I know I'm not talking to people who don't know. I know that you are fully aware. So Paul was kind of harsh. But you know, sometimes we need to wake up each other with some firm words. Sometimes we need to say to a brother or a sister, you're going over the gully. If you continue along that road, you're going to drop in a precipice. Well, you know, sometimes, especially these days we're hearing about corporal punishment and how wrong it is, and we should not put that on our children. You know, matter of fact, in certain places, certain jurisdictions right now, if you do that, you find yourself in prison. <laughs> I am so glad it won't come into law, or it didn't come into law back then. You ask Alison. It works. It works. But of course, it must be done in a context. Because God does it too. 
God has his time when he issues hard words. But he issues his hard words against a background of love and care and a desire for us to do better. I know I'm getting in some trouble with some people today. But I prefer to get in trouble with you than to get in trouble with God. Because I tell you, it's far easier on me than some people. <laughs> you know, one of the purposes of the church, and you know there are many, is to help us to grow. Is to help us to get to that place of maturity where we are able to handle the knowledge that is being imparted to us. Paul was very upset that he had a group of children that he has been teaching, that he has been nurturing, and he wants to give them a certain kind of food because that's where they should now be. And he's saying, all oh, Noah can't stop giving you milk. So the surrendering Christian understands perfectly that among all the disciplines and all the virtues that he will have to embrace and practice and perfect over time, there are two things you will not find a surrendering Christian leaving behind. A surrendering Christian is one who really does love the Lord. He or she demonstrates this by walking in obedience to his word. And by walking in obedience is a demonstration of surrender. What that attitude, that posture is saying, I am giving up what I want. I over there so me really want to go. I, I'm not even going to try to hide it from you because I know you know already. I hope this something like. I hope this something feel comfortable. I hope this something get big up. But you say, I hope this something must go. <laughs> I am going to give up that. Why? Because I want to please you. Because I love you. So although I don't like to over there, so. Over there, so they cost me all the time. Over there, so they tell me how I'm ugly. Over there, so they make me feel small. But Lord, you say, over there, so I must go. I don't understand why. But because I know you do all things well, I am going all the same. I may have shared this story with you a million times. I want to make it a million and one today. I would have told you about my mom who is now gone to be with the Lord. <clears throat> and that what she did primarily, I say for the most part of her life, as a living, apart from being a housewife, was that she was a domestic helper. And as a domestic help, especially back in those days, there was a kind of mindset that those who employ domestic helpers used to demonstrate. First of all, they make it very clear that you are the employee. They are the employer. And some of them felt that it was right and okay to treat domestic helpers any way they choose. So they would overwork you, they'd underpay you. They'd give you the dirtiest things to do that they would never even consider doing at home. And they would speak to you in such disrespectful ways that sometimes, if you're not careful, you commit murder. And as the eldest of my siblings, I used to hear my mom coming home many times with tears in her eyes and saying, I'm not going back tomorrow. I used to get a lot of it because I was the eldest. And although I didn't understand all of what she was explaining, I understood enough to recognize that she was being badly treated. 
And the next morning, I would see her getting ready to go to work. I said, Mom, oh, you see you're not going back. And she would turn to me and the other children and say, I'm going back because of you. I, I, want, you, I want you to have a better chance than me. I want to see you. The term she used to use, maybe you're familiar with it. I want to see your children pass the worst. <laughs> I don't know if I pass it yet. But <laughs> I want to see your children pass the worst. And you know, it's when I got older and started to think back, I realized that there was and there should always be in the life of the child of God that something that makes you want to do the things that God wants. Above everything else, that is what you want to do, even though you don't like it. <laughs> but you know, the God that we serve is so good that the things he asks us to do, he arranged it in such a way that we find joy doing it. Have you noticed that? So the Lord Jesus, our perfect example, said, is it possible that this cup may pass from me? I am just imagining as a human being with my very simple mind, visioning the Lord Jesus, looking into the cup that he must now drink, filled with our transgressions and all our grime and dirt. And when you look at the pain that that was going to inflict, and I'm not talking now about the physical pain only, but the spiritual torture that was rightfully our place, and he said to God, for our own record, is it possible that this cup could pass from me? I really have to drink this? Don't you see, as God the Father, what he's going to do to me? And then he resigned in surrender. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Brothers and sisters, are we serious about surrender? I believe all leadership is serious. For any church that considers a subject like this for its congregation has got to be serious. This is not play church business. This is coming to the very foundation of what church is about. A surrendered life. So when a decision is to be made or a direction is to be taken. What this maturing Christian is pondering most is what does the Bible say? <laughs> Not how I feel. Or is this what I think? Or I don't see anything wrong with that. The big question and the only question that matters to the maturing, to the growing, to the surrendering Christian is, what does God have to say about this? No excuses. Straight up. How will God want? I'm um, sorry for my listeners overseas. What is it that God wants? How will we find out what God wants? The only way is to study his word. One of the disciplines of the life of a disciple. One of the different disciplines of the life of a surrendering Christian. If I am going to know how to please the master, then I must know what the master is saying. And the only way to do so is to study his word. Paul, in writing to his young spiritual son, In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, implores him, study 
to show thyself approved unto God. And I want you to notice this, unto God. <laughs> Not unto men. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The psalmist, encouraging us along similar lines, in looking at what the surrendered life looks like, he admonishes from his own testimony. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The surrendering life is a life that honors the word of God. There is no way that we can live a surrendering life and not put premium on the word of God. And let me close. A surrendering life is a life of prayer. It's a life that understands that in a similar way that the physical body needs breath from every intake of air with the right proponent of oxygen in the same way that the spiritual life needs prayer in order that it may be healthy. So if you are in an area, maybe a building, and it has caught fire, or maybe even if there's no such tragedy impending, but sometimes you step into a room and it just doesn't smell right. It's musty, dusty, something not right. And immediately you take action, not only to make the noise about the place not right. You either come out or you take steps to fix it. Why? Because it's not good for you. Brothers and sisters, if we are serious about surrendering, if we are serious about maturing, if we are serious about growing, we have to be a praying people. And I'm not just talking about the prayer meetings we have at church. In fact, that is just supposed to be the smallest part of our praying. Don't look at me so strange, brothers and sisters. Because I know that you know it's true. You know why many times we don't have the successes and victories that we're supposed to have? It's because we're not praying as we should. So let me see if I can link it in an illustration. The maturing Christian understands that the moment his or her gaze is not on the Lord, anything is likely. Anything is likely. You must have watched some of these sporting events. And I have developed quite an interest in mixed martial arts. I love to watch it. But sometimes I can't wait for the end to come. So sometimes I just skip some of the fights and just go to the knockouts. And have you ever seen some of those very funny knockouts where one opponent receives a blow, a serious blow. And it takes a little while before they start to respond, like a delayed reaction. And sometimes when the person falls to the ground, or the canvas as they say, in their state of partial consciousness, in some instances you see them with their arms stretched out just the same, as if they are fighting. In some instances, you see where the person is on the ground, but gets confused to the point where they start to fight the referee. You haven't seen any of those. There are some like that. Some referees get some stiff lick, man. 
just because they get so confused with the punch or with the kick or whatever it might have been, they don't know where they are. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. We need to get to the place in our prayer life if we are serious about submission. We are the first thing we want to do before anything else is to pray. It's a natural reaction just like breathing. I know some people get upset and sometimes they say it and I'm glad when they say it because sometimes I get to know a co-worker who knows I'm a Christian will share a little situation and I say let us pray <laughs> and I say you, you, you pray about that? I say yes because I don't want to tell the wrong thing I, I, I have a lot of experience with a lot of things. <laughs> but I have a lot of experience with most of them wrong. And I know how easy, with good intentions, things can go wrong. <laughs> so the attitude of the maturing Christian is this. No step will be made in any direction with an intention to please the Lord without watering it first with prayer. So Paul, in writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, in chapter 5 and verse 17, encourages them, pray without ceasing. And by this, of course, you know, it doesn't mean that you're always wording prayers. <laughs> but you're in an attitude, a state of mind, that is a prayerful one. So I'm at the place where I'm not at church. I'm at work. I am engaged in the duties to which I am normally accustomed. But something happened. And like the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, they can just say, Lord, save me. You remember Peter? I, I, I know a lot of us don't like Peter more than so. But, but I like Peter. You know? I like Peter. Uh, I see some of myself in Peter. Especially the mistakes part. <laughs> because what I have observed about Peter is that Peter wants to learn. Eager to learn. In fact, they call him impetuous. Because he, he tends to just jump at it. Sometimes he jump out there and then he said, What am I supposed to do again? <laughs> So Peter said, Lord, I, I want to walk on the water like you. And he doesn't wait for any instruction. He doesn't wait to hear the Lord say, listen, you must, when you're going on water, your toe must not touch the water first. You must always go with your heel, and your toe must be pointing vertically. And it must be the right foot first, and not the left. So Peter gone out there. And he stepped out and said, but Lord, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that like us sometimes? And we only call in prayer when we start to mash it up. Isn't that true? Or is me alone? So the surrendering life is a life that says, listen, you see, every step that I make it must be ordered by the Lord. I want every step to be right. And therefore, because I want it to be right, I want to hear him say, left, right. Left, right. And when he says right, left, I want to hear that too. <laughs> so let me close by mentioning four things that the surrendered life should never forget about prayer. I won't be able to build on each of them because I think my time is gone. But I think you'll be able to relate to them very well. The first one. A surrendering life prays and puts premium on prayer because prayer builds relationship. Christianity offers a genuine relationship with our living God. I don't think I can say it too many times. Christianity promises 
that you can and will encounter the one true living God through prayer. We can have a thriving and growing relationship with him if we so choose. We can restore the relationship we were meant to have with him, which was disturbed by sin. We can enjoy this relationship for the rest of eternity. Prayer is an essential means of forming that relationship, fostering it, and increasing it. Because we are saying by praying, Lord, I'm depending on you. I surrender. Secondly, another important thing that the surrendering life does not allow to slip as it relates to prayer is that prayer changes the surrendering life. One of the most common questions people ask about prayer is whether or not it changes God. <laughs> well, it's always an easy question to answer because we know what the word says. God does not change. So if God is unchangeable, and if he always knows the future, why should I bother to pray, some people ask me. And I'm sure they ask you too. It's still going to go how oh, God planned it anyway, so why bother to pray? This is a really valid question with at least two answers. In the first place, prayer does not change the unchangeable God, yet it still does make a difference. God ordains not only the end of all things, but the means to all things as well. I mentioned that when we spoke the last time. And I shared with you that when we are willing to surrender to God and allow him control of our lives, he arranges circumstances around us. You, you remember? You don't remember. So God can arrange the circumstances around us in such a way. He wants to move your next door, but he sends you all the way to Spanish town. <laughs> and then to Olab. <laughs> and then carry you back to Kingston. And when you come back, you say, clear down next door. <laughs> and you say, what a waste of time. What a waste of money. The disciples had difficulties with the Lord like that. When they looked at the woman who came to worship with her expensive oil, they said, what a waste. Because they were missing something of value. You see that journey that the Lord allowed us to go on? It's for a reason. You're not going to survive next door until you get the lessons that come with going to Spanish town and not Olaba first. Spanish town, then Olaba, then kiss down, then come back. <laughs> Are you with me? All right, I need to stop now. God ordains what he will to do in a certain situation or to accomplish a certain purpose. Yet, he also ordains that prayer will be the means by which he does it. You know, I, I, I've been having this pain for two weeks straight, nonstop. Who is praying? Show up your hand because the pain gone. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I listen to have to do anything. Oh, thank you, Lord. God acts through prayer. Not apart from prayer. This means there are many things God will not do if you will not pray. I wonder if you heard me. But there are many things he will do if we will pray. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves... And seek my face. This God, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, is the God we serve. He is the all-powerful, all-consuming, almighty God. And he's still powerful today to do all things, even beyond our wildest imagination. Number three. Prayer prepares us. Because we pray, God will do certain things, grant certain things, or permit certain things 
he otherwise would not have apart from prayer. Prayer is one of the means he uses to prepare us to receive whatever he gives and whatever he does. If God extends grace, great grace, mercy, great mercy to us, prayer will prepare us to receive it without pride and without presumption. As I was driving in this morning, I was listening to one of those programs on the radio. And they were doing an interview with members of the Grace Thrillers. And one of the questions that the interviewer asked was, looking back at your achievement as such a great gospel group, what is it that kept you to remain humble? And before they answer the question, they play, played one of their popular songs. You know the song I'm talking about? Um... I'm trying to remember it now. It's a song that goes, um, if I consider myself too high, bring me down. You know, you know the one I'm talking? That's the one. And I tell you something. You know, I've always admired Grace Trillers. Well, some of you are close to me know that. They have had their bumps in life too, serious bumps. I have been close to some of the members of the group, the older group. And they have had their experiences too in their walk. And they will tell you, they talk about it quite openly. And that song came out of an experience that they had as a group. There was a turbulent time that they had when the group was almost completely destroyed. And one of the things that was happening at that time was that the main person responsible for the group had taken a kind of attitude in the way he treated those who made up the group. To the point where some relationships got destroyed. I don't want to say too much about that. But just to say, God has a way of preparing us. And sometimes we resist the preparation because we don't like the work that is involved. Sometimes we resist the preparation because when the Lord is preparing us for something, it's not really so nice. But if we are able to do what Paul encourages us to do, and he says, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, in other words, listen, God has something nice, man. Just wait now. Just hold on a little bit. I know it's hard, but hang on a little. I don't know how many times you have been a little ashamed like myself. When just shortly after we give up, <laughs> we see what the Lord is doing. <laughs> I tell you, it's a terrible feeling. Terrible feeling. And when that happens to you, I want to make sure that, listen, you see, next time, no matter how long it is, I'm going to wait on you, Lord. You are right. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It's a serious thing. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a serious thing. But you know, we all want to be mature, but we want it now. Maturing takes time. You go to the market, and I know Brother Teddy goes to the market as often as me. Not the same one, but I know. And you just need to look around on the produce. There's nothing that is allowed to get fit anymore. Everything half baked. <laughs> green mango. And I was going to say green pepper, but I want you to get the point I'm making. Immature pepper. <laughs> Sometimes you buy the yam, and when you start to peel the yam, you see the, the, the upper layer of the skin of the yam, underneath it green. We 
can't wait. We are an instant generation. Everything must happen now. Instant coffee. They have cooker now. They don't want any slow cooker. Instant cooker now. <laughs> Everything. And as a result, all the problems that come with instant. There was a time when we used to grow children. We give them time to learn how to be children. Enjoy childhood. And then they come before they can even walk. They have on everything that the adult are wear. Ears ring. Nose ring. All kind of ring ring out them ears. We want it now. But God says wait. Lastly. I know you fire me now. Prayer brings results. Because we are in genuine friendship and relationship with God, He answers our prayers. At the most basic but astounding level, prayer works. It works. Believe me, it works. God is not obligated to anyone and does whatever He wishes because He's God. But he chooses to act through prayer and because of prayer, not apart from prayer. This means that prayer brings results when we invoke God on his terms. When we approach him the way he says. When he does it his way. Prayer makes a difference to the world. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 reminds us, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. If it goes on. For everyone who asks receives. I want you to listen to this. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So brothers and sisters, why should our hands be at our cheek? Why should our faces look so gloomy? Why should we live in despair? And we call ourselves the children of the Most High God. Let us talk to our Heavenly Father. He waits to hear. He longs to show off on the kingdom of darkness. What he can do when his people choose to surrender and come to him in prayer. And watch him work miracles and shame the kingdom of darkness. Elijah was a man like we are. The Bible clearly demonstrated that he has his time when he was strong and he had his time when he was weak. And I believe God has recorded such details for us to appreciate that those that he has recorded for our learning are men just as we are with frailties just as we have. Yet, <laughs> Elijah stood before God in total confidence of what God would do. And he prayed to God and said, Stop the rain. And rain stopped. Then he went back to God and he said, Lord, please let it rain. And rain fell. Oh God, we need some rain in Bethany. Oh God, we need some Elijah's in Bethany. 
I believe that God is waiting. Have you ever sensed sometimes when we come together like this that something is just about to, like we are just next door to something big and it's like it just keep eluding us <laughs> and it just keep eluding us you know long I believe God has been wanting to do some big things here but guess what we refuse to surrender <laughs> God will not work in a life that is not his to control. God will not direct his mercies and power in a life that he does not control. God will not manifest himself among a people who are unwilling to give him control. And I tell you something, there are so many times when many of us have come to that place where we said, this year is it. I can feel it in the air. You know that song that we used to sing, that old time song? There's a feeling in the air that God and his resurrection power, that same one, is moving in this hour. He might be glorified, something like that. <laughs> As I was preparing to come to you today, I had that feeling. You know, sometimes, like you, I get a little discouraged. Because I believe that God has been so patient with us. I believe that God has been so loving and long suffering but it's like there is a a resistance to just make that next step it's like there is just that something i don't know what that something is that is preventing us from just letting go and say god take control and i'm just wondering if we are going to let that happen another year <laughs> are we going to let 2023 be like 2022, 2021, 2020, 2090. When he has talked at our hearts so many times and we have quietly sat at our seats and we say, yes, Lord. And as we go through the gate, we forget it. I don't think that's what the Lord wants. And I don't think he's very happy with that kind of approach to our Christian walk. I just hope I'm not making too many enemies today. I hope you really understand that I'm just trying to be obedient because I have some fixing up to do too. Maybe more than you. But I am very clear <laughs> As I bring this time with you to a close, I am very clear that we are not lacking in understanding of what God wants of us at Bethany. We are not lacking. You know where our lack is? We have an unwillingness to surrender. I am going to beg you for a couple more minutes. Because I believe that there are some persons who have been listening. I know we are a little late today. Bear with me, please. Bear with me a little longer. Who have been longing a long time for something to happen in our individual lives and among us here at Bethany. And I just wonder if, even if it's one person, Say today is my day. Today is my day. Brother Facey, include me in your prayer because today is my day. Is there somebody like that? I'm going to sing that song. I know it's a song that you have to sing when you're really serious. So if I don't see you singing or hear you singing, I, I, it's all right. Because it's a song of commitment. 
And I don't just want you to sing it because you know it. I want you to sing it because you are saying, listen, I, I am not going to take any less than what God has to give me. But I want to use this opportunity to speak to my unsafe friends who are here as well. Because you have never said yes to Jesus, but you know that God loves you. You know that he has died for you. You know that he has made provisions for you. And you know that he wants you to serve him. And he has talked to you many times. And the truth is, this might be my last message. <laughs> this might be the last time you hear me. <laughs> I don't know what is going to happen the next minute. The Lord may come before church finish. And the question is, if he comes and you are not saved, God help you. And I mean that. So I'm going to raise this song. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. We are going to sing the chorus one last time. And if this is where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I know we have our struggles. I am very conscious that everything is not the way we want them to be. But let me tell you something, my friend. When the Lord comes, a lot of things are still not going to be where they should be. But if we make this one thing right, I guarantee you on the basis of God's word, he will put everything in place. He will arrange the circumstances in such a way that the end becomes exactly what you want and what he wants. And I'm just wondering, are we ready, Bethany, to surrender? We are not just going through a series. We are not just presenting some subjects. We are seeking to have lives that are responsive to God's word. All to him I freely give. I will ever, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. here today whether virtually or in this sanctuary but you have never said yes to the claims of Jesus on your life you may be saying brother Faith, yeah, there are so many things I don't know so many things I don't understand but I believe that God loves me 
I believe that when Jesus died, he died for me. And I want to be saved. I want to surrender to him. I want him to receive me as his child. Cleanse me and make me his own. Can you include me in your prayer? If you are like that, I want to stand with the saints. If you are not here, but you are worshiping with us virtually, I'm going to ask you to place your right hand on the instrument from which you are watching and hearing us. Because as I pray this prayer, I want for you to pray it from your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I confess my sins and ask you to wash me by the blood of Jesus and make me clean. I promise that I will read your word. I will fellowship with those who love you. And I will tell those around me what you have done for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Loving Father, I commit to you all those who are standing. And I'm thinking now particularly of those who are struggling spiritually. We know where you want us to be, but we know we are not there. But like David, we ask you to create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Oh, that our hearts will hunger and thirst after you as the deer pants for the water brooks. Lord, may our focus our desire, our consuming desire is to please the God who has loved us so completely. Lord, we are standing, but we are shouting, help me. Help me, Holy Spirit. Fill me. Work through me. Glow through me. Speak through me. I surrender, Holy Spirit. Take me over and do what you want. Because I know whatever you do is always well done. And even when I don't understand, loving Father, help me to trust you. Lord, move among the benches. Stir the hearts that are struggling. And comfort those who need to find peace this afternoon. Lord, let us not leave this place without receiving what you are serving right now. Lord, we have said no for too long. We have said too many half yeses. Today we are saying, yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way, yes, Lord, yes, I will answer. And I will obey. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Bring our hearts to that place of surrender, we beg you. And let us run free, knowing that our steps are ordered by the Lord. Thank you, loving Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.